Welcome back to our regular Friday night talk series on breaking memes. Tonight's talk is being broadcasted across, across 16 Buddhist organizations' Facebook pages. The topic for breaking myth number 20 is too busy to meditate. Now, Buddhism is often summarized in three sentences as do good, avoid evil, and purify the mind. So is meditation really necessary as a Buddhist? And uh, what about those who say they have no time to meditate? Now, before we introduce the speaker, let's uh, give a short introduction. Dr. Punya Wong is an associate professor in internal medicine at the Monash University Malaysia in Johor Bahru. He has been sharing the Dhamma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok in the last decade. Let's welcome our Singse, Dr. Punya Wong, for the Breaking Nif number 20. Too busy to meditate. Over to you, Dr. Punya. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Let me share screen. Hi. Okay. Now, tonight's talk is for everybody who is too busy to meditate. The people who are hard working, spending a lot of time in the office and have no time to meditate. Other people that are targeted in this sharing. So it is also known as meditation for busy working people or meditation for the non-meditator. If you already have a regular meditating practice, please continue. This is targeted to those who are really very busy, powerful business people in high corporate positions, really say, I have no time. Now, there are problems with some words that we must be clear about right from the start. So let us be clear about a few words. And these few words include bhavana, sati, samadhi, and of course the word meditation. The word meditation was chosen by the early translators in the early 20th and late 19th century because they were not aware of any other better word. And so for good or for bad, we are stuck with the word meditation in many ways, but we must realize that the word meditation has a lot of cultural baggage. If you speak to five different people, five of them may have different opinions as to what meditation is. So let us go back and look at what the Buddha taught us. First and foremost, remember, the very foundation of our spiritual life is dana, followed by sila, and then bhavana. These are the three keywords. And often bhavana is translated as meditation, which unfortunately is a poor choice of word. Now, all three steps are needed in our spiritual path. Dana or generosity is the very foundation. And this is not just generosity in terms of material things, but generosity in terms of time, skill, knowledge, experience. And these are very important. For example, our sharing myths sessions on Fridays would not be able to continue if not for wise, generous people offering their IT skills. In many ways, dana or generosity is a training to let go of things that we are very attached to. Second is precepts, sila or morality. Now, sila or precepts is a manner for which we are to behave. You will notice as we took the five precepts just now, 
that there is nothing religious in the five precepts. They are secular human values. They are values which anyone can appreciate. And in fact, they are values which are important for us to have harmonious coexistence and living. And these are important life skills such that we can live together as a community. Third is the word bhavana. Now bhavana is actually continuous mental development. Now continuous mental development is a all around the clock phenomenon. And if you note these three words, continuous mental development, you will know that the word meditation is not equal to this. Meditation is only one aspect of continuous mental development. And continuous mental development is development through mental training, learning the Dhamma, applying the Dhamma in our daily life. Now, as I mentioned, meditation is only one aspect of bhavana. Formal meditation is one aspect of bhavana. And in this stick, there are two ends. On one end is what you and I often hear, a familiar word called samatha. Samatha meditation. Samatha meditation best illustrated, for example, with mindfulness of our breathing, just being aware, consciously aware of our breathing in and breathing out. And this method is to help us develop relaxation, calmness, and stillness. Now, again, very often this word is translated as concentration, but concentration is not correct. Samatha is actually calmness or stillness. And in the Agamas in Chinese, it is translated as Zhen Ting, calmness, stillness. And this is something doable. And so this helps us to calm our emotional mind. The other hand of the stick is mindfulness training, what you often hear as sati. And this, very often you will see in the four foundations of mindfulness, whether you are being mindful of the body, of feelings, etc. It is the training of introspection, to look inwards into our minds and bodies objectively. And this helps us to train the intellectual mind. All of it is needed because this is the spiritual path. So bhavana in Chinese is siu si, cultivation, to repeat constantly. And formal meditation that you and I are aware of is perhaps maybe 15 minutes to an hour. And that's it. It is only one aspect of bhavana, while the mental training that the Buddha wants us to have is 24 hours non-stop. So meditation is one preparation for bhavana, together with knowledge of the Dhamma, obtaining right views, right intention, correct manners, correct livelihood, and of course the effort to sustain it so that we can have calmness and mindfulness throughout the day. Sati is actually quite a difficult word to translate. In Chinese, it is nian. You will see nian is a composite of two words. On top, present, and below, sing, which is referring to the mind. The present mind. What is happening to the mind at every point in time. So very often we hear, I'm so busy, I have no time for meditation. But do not be trapped by concepts or words, because no matter how busy we are, you will have time for meditation. If you have time to breathe, if you have time to walk, you have the time to sleep, you actually have time for meditation. Now, Ajahn Chah said, 
Don't think that just sitting with your eyes closed is practice. If you do think this way, then please change your thinking. Steady practice is having the attitude of practice in whatever you are doing, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down. When coming out of even formal sitting meditation, realize that you are just changing postures. If you reflect in this way, you will have peace and you will realize that you are practicing constantly. You are practicing to be constantly aware. So, Bhavana, a mental training, is not in books, not in manuals, not in chanting, not in recitation, not in rites, not in rituals. The real practice is by way of body, speech, and mind that is aware at moment to moment of what is arising and what is happening in our body, in our mind, and not to allow defilements to arise, whether in part or completely. A few years ago, I was at Bikuni's Damanandas Training Center west of Bangkok. Bikuni Damananda is a giant in the world of Buddhism. She was a professor of Buddhist studies before she renounced and became a nun. And we were in her center meditating, and she asked us, Why do you put your hand? in this posture of one hand being cradled by the other hand when you are meditating? Well, none of my group could answer. And she laughed and she said, the reason why you put your hand in this posture is because your mind represented by the hand that is cradling the other hand is watching all the other five sense organs represented by your thumb and the four fingers of your eyes, your ear, your nose, your tongue, your touch. You are constantly watching, cradling whatever arises in these five sense doors. And that, she said, is meditation. And you can be doing that whether you are sitting, walking, lying, etc. What a wonderful teaching, really opened my mind. Now the four postures described in the Satipatthana Sutta is sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. And these four principal posture encompasses most activities in daily life 2,500 or 2,600 years ago. However, in the 21st century, we need to add one more posture in Satipatthana, and that is the handphone holding posture. Because now we spend as much time doing this than the other four. Now, to remove the mysticism around meditation that many of us carry because of our cultural background, stories, movies, I will have to talk a little bit and this will break many myths you have about meditation. So, first and foremost, of course, formal meditation is important. When you sit in formal meditation in a very dignified posture, whether on a chair or a sofa or cross-legged, you are calming the mind, training it to rest from the usual state of frenzy talk. Now, it is important for you to realize that meditation is not going to make our life's problems disappear. We are still going to grow old, fall sick. We are still going to have pleasure, pain. We are still going to have praise and blame. But it gives us a clearer picture of these problems and to respond rationally with wisdom and not emotions. So if you can understand this, then you can understand this question. Can we meditate while attending to every day's business? The answer is, of course, yes, we can. You can make mindfulness a way of life rather than as a practice 15 minutes a day or 20 or 30 minutes a day, which is separate from your daily living. And the younger we start this, the better it is. Someone asked, 
when is the best age? And I answered, the present moment is the best age, no matter what you are now. I too was once young with black hair and hair, of course. It is never too late and never too early. Now, as a lay person, what is our desired goal in attempting to do what I share? First, we want our mind to function in a calm, relaxed manner. With metta, karuna, love and compassion, rationally, and hopefully to ultimately awaken to the realities of life. We also want to have a gradual improvement in our response to life's many stresses. Life is very stressful and often we react. Here, we are trying to train our mind to be calm, relax, and with metta karuna, respond rather than react, leading to harmonious mannerism and conduct and having peace and happiness. So first, we've got to set the ambient temperature by progressively renouncing our greed and conceit. If we are constantly in conflict within and without, it is difficult because whether it is family problems or work problems or education problems, if we are constantly in conflict, there is a lot of negative energies of anger, hostility, judgment, fear, criticism. And hence, if we are serious in this path, it is actually often preferable to turn the other cheek and maintain one's spiritual composure than to fight for everything. Because many a times, the suffering is not worth the suffering. Now, the truth is, whatever things that we wish to pursue to, it is going to hurt us in some way. So we got to find the ones that are worth suffering for. So certainly there are situations where we have to dig our heels and stand up, but we have to weigh the cost of doing this and the gratification of feeling victorious or vindicated versus the peace of mind. Often to lose is to win. Now the next thing is to decide that yes, we indeed want to have not only dana sila, but bhavana incorporated in our lives, which means to say, we have made a conscious decision to say, I want to train my mind. Herein, you are making a decision to mind the mind, leading to a greater awareness of how your mind works coming back to your senses now. And hence, if you wish to know it, then you have to watch it while it is happy, angry, sad, fearful, in all its emotional states. So we have to discover the nature of the mind. What are our thoughts and feelings now? Are they wholesome? How do they come and go? In other words, you have to develop the skill of introspection, igniting the awareness within. We are aware very much outside, but we are not used to being aware or at least trying to be aware inside. And here we want to be aware of it all, whatever it is that is arising in our brain, in our mind, whether it is buy a new dress, to eat chocolate, etc. Whatever it is, let us be aware of its arising. So watch what we let into our minds. There's a whole long list of things that we can allow into our mind. Let us jaga it very well. Your immediate insight, once you decide to do this, is that you will realize that your mind flickers like a monkey jumping from tree to tree. You will realize that most things are impermanent. Feelings arise, feelings go away. Thoughts arise, thoughts go away. And later on, you will realize that there is a difference between 
there is suffering and I am suffering. When you say I am suffering, you have personalized the suffering. You need not have to do that. And it is only when we cease to be involved with our emotions can peaceful equanimity arise. So simply watch the emotions instead of being the emotion. And now I'm going to share with you a very important reason why we want to have bhavana or to meditate. And that is, we do not want our emotional mind to dominate our thinking process. Introspection is to be given the eyes to look within and to see that all things, whether good or bad, it too will pass. And when you can do that, you can tap into a bliss or a peaceful state no matter how hectic the external environment. Now you have three brains, not a brain, but three. Most people do not realize this. The very old brain, which we call the brain stem, takes care silently of our survival needs. Heartbeat, breathing, run, fight, sexual drive, all this is the same in the dinosaur, in the dog, in the lizard, and us, the brainstem, the oldest brain. On top of the brainstem, the oldest brain, we have got what is called a limbic system, an emotional brain. This is the brainstem, which is silent. This is the emotional brain, which gives you and me the emotions that we feel. This evolved after this. And hence, for example, dogs, elephants have very highly developed emotional brains. And then we develop what is called the neocortex. Neo means new. The new brain, where we can have logic, mathematics, philosophy, physics, etc. These three brains function separately. The Buddha Dharma meditation teaches us to let our rational brain be in control. Decisions to be made rationally rather than being driven by emotions. Now, most of our decisions that we make day to day, if you look at it objectively, you will realize that it is made by the emotional mind. A teenager, a child, gives very good example of this. They function very much at the emotional level, which is why a teenager will go for instant gratification and sometimes as parents, we shout, we scream, and we say, why, 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 why don't you think before you act? Did you not think of the consequences? They will say. But the reality is, at that age, they have not evolved fully to use the logical mind. They are still functioning very much at the emotional level, and we are partly to blame when we give the child, oh, you do this, I give you a chocolate. We're actually encouraging instant gratification. As you grow older, some people never grow that stage, but as you grow older, the logical mind becomes more dominant and then we tend to make decisions based more on logic, balancing emotion to give rise to a wise decision. With meditation or bhavana, Samatha meditation or calm or stillness meditation helps us to calm down the emotional mind so that the logical mind can function. So in a calm state of low emotion, calm and relaxed, which is what Samatha meditation or exemplified the mindfulness of our breath hopes to attain, 
is to calm the emotional state of the part of the brain, the limbic system, the amygdala down, so that the neocortex is dominant. When the emotional brain is highly stimulated, the higher cortex is disabled. And hence, you go back to a childlike or teenage-like mind. High emotions, and you do not reason it out logically or rationally. Now, insight meditation or vipassana meditation trains us to look logically, rationally, objectively, and not let emotions dominate our mind. Put it simply, Dhamma family, the Buddha's training accelerates your evolution so that you become a higher being functioning with logic and rationality rather than back to a animal or childhood state or immature state which is functioning with emotions. Now emotions are of course temporary states. They come, they go depending on causes and conditions. And if we are to make decisions based on emotions, they can permanently scar us. Those of the older generation who watch Star Trek will know this character, Mr. Spock, a Vulcan who came from a much more evolved society than us humans. And the Vulcans function predominantly with logic, not allowing their emotions to dominate. And that is why Mr. Spock very often will say that's illogical whenever a captain makes some decision. Now, most of our mistakes and many of our decisions are made because we allow emotions to overrule logic. And I often give the example that I can tell a person, you are a diabetic, please cut down on cakes and dessert. For the first two, three weeks, he or she will follow. But after a while, you cannot overrule the old brain, the brain stem which says, food, take it. And the emotional brain which says, oh, it's so lovely, it's so nice, it's so smooth. And the logical brain is thrown aside. And that's a good example why diets will fail. Now, when dealing with people, remember, we are not dealing with creatures of logic unless you're a highly trained Buddhist, but creatures of emotion. I hope that you understand this slide that I'm sharing, because when you do, and if you do, then meditation is not mythical. It's logical, it's secular, and you understand why you're doing it. So you want your brain to be more an adult brain rather than a teenage brain. You want your evolution from a primitive brain to a higher brain, because this is where you make judgment, decision, reasoning, problem solving, versus the teenage frontal brain, which says, I want this, or I am going to throw tantrums. So whether we are at work, at play, or at rest, the Dhamma encompasses all aspects. And we can use the techniques that the Buddha taught us, watching the mind, samasati, calming ourselves, samma, samata, samadhi, so that it becomes a habit that we break the cycle of reacting. But now instead, responding. So it is important, again, I emphasize, the meditation cushion in formal meditation is very important, but it is more important to extend it beyond the cushion because it is not postures that leads to enlightenment. And very often I'm asked, why is my meditation not getting better? Instead, I think you should ask, is my response to life getting better rather than why is my meditation not getting better. Because we don't meditate to get better at meditating. We get 
to be better at life because of our meditation. So now let's apply these simple techniques that I will share that every one of us can practice. Little though you recite the sacred text, but as long as you put the teaching into practice, as long as you watch your mind and don't allow lust, hatred, delusion to come to fruition, you are better than anyone who is doing rites and rituals. Number one, Brother Wei Li just now, as we were preparing for this talk, said, oh, I am back to now driving one hour to work. I smiled because I want to share now that Brother Whaley has got one hour of meditation every day as he drives to work and as he drives back home from work. Imagine, he has two hours meditation. And you can also do this as you drive on the North-South Highway when we allow interstate travel. You can first start by saying KL to Strombat, then KL to Malacca, then KL to Aihitam, and finally KL to JV. And what I want you to do is that I want you to practice metta meditation while you drive. And it is so simple. Every time a car overtakes you, and many, many cars will overtake you, especially when you drive slow like me, our instant reaction is give the flood a middle finger. Why the hell you overtake me? That's our usual reaction. Now we want to do what I call transforming thoughts to transform our reactive anger conditioned right from young and maybe even from past lives to a wholesome thought. Every time a car overtakes Brother Whaley, every time a car overtakes Brother Chu Bun or Brother Bobby, in your mind, you say, may you be happy. May you be well. May you be safe. Whatever words you're comfortable with. And very important, as this car speed away from you, you must direct that emotion of meta towards him. And I think that's very important. You must actually project that meta towards that car speeding away from you. So imagine Brother Whaley, one hour as he goes to work, so many cars will overtake him. As long as every car overtake him, he just say, may you be well. May you reach your destination safely. He would have meditated many, many times. Next week, he's driving down to JB. It will be a fantastic chanda, aspiration for him to practice this as he drives down. Wonderful practice. This practice replaces unwholesome thoughts with wholesome thoughts. And everyone, as Sister Eileen drives to work, as Brother Bobby drives from Malacca to Kale. This is a simple meditation technique that all of us can do. So don't worry. Some people have told me, if I meditate, 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 will I become an unfeeling rock? I say, no. The better you are with insight, with views that are correct, you will have more metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. Because although we call these emotions, this is actually the state of mind when you understand non-self, interconnectedness, and how every one of us is interdependent on each other. Now, the next thing is what I call a game boy. This is what I have at home. I made it myself, one for my wife, one for me. And I call this a Game Boy. Because one of the problems is people relate that, yes, I can do it for five minutes, but beyond that, my mind runs everywhere from A to Z. 
And so, if that happens, a simple technique of anchoring our attention is very helpful. And this, as you finger each bead, breathe in and breathe out. The next bead, breathe in and breathe out, etc. Soon you will calm down and you can stop fingering and just look at yourself breathing in and breathing out. Or if you still have difficulty, then you can use a method very popular in Thailand to use the word buddho. With every beat, you breathe in and you say bud. You breathe out and you say do, silently, of course. And the next beat, as you breathe in, bud. As you breathe out, do, silently, slowly, watching the space in between the words. This helps you to still the mind and it trains you not to have unwise reactions to life because now you are calm and relaxed and you have time to respond rather than react. So these are important life skills because often at work, in school, at home, we are emotionally provoked or challenged in many ways. To remain calm and relaxed is an important life skill. Conscious breathing can be our anchor. Now this, for those who know me, will notice my handphone at every hour, there's a gong. That gong comes from this Mindfulness Bell app, which is free. Download it from Google Play, install it on your phone, and you can set it to give that gong time at whatever time you want it to be. So this is a modern gong replacing the one in a temple. That gong, when it goes, brings us instantly to the present moment. In that moment when the gong sounds, we reflect, what is my mind doing now? What am I doing now? You hear the sound come up, stay and goes away. And you're reminded all phenomena similarly arise, be there for a while and it goes away. This is an app that I highly recommend for everyone. If you set it to every hour, at the very least, every hour, you have 15 seconds where now you reflect back, introspect into your mind and ask yourself, what is my mind doing now? Is it angry? Is it sad? Is it happy? Be aware. So present moment awareness is the body and the mind in the same place. Very often, as you meditate or as you train in Bhavana, you will realize that the body and mind are in two different places. Walking. Every one of us need to walk, whether to the bus stop, to the car, to the car park, to the multi-story car park, or after parking the car, to the office. If, if you can walk, you can train in mindfulness. Just walk calmly, let the mind be at ease, and be just aware now of the steps, because this is the most obvious thing as you are walking. Just be with the steps, whether it's left or right, be aware. And then you will notice as you are being aware that there will be thoughts. Do not judge, simply be aware some people find using the word thinking at that time helpful. I leave it to you. Some people find even the word thinking a distraction. So just be aware of thoughts. Let it come into awareness and you will note it will leave naturally as soon as you are aware of it. 
And even if you have a lot of thoughts as you are walking, your awareness of it is good meditation. Now, someone may ask, what is it different then from the time when I'm walking and I'm thinking about my office work? The difference is here, you allow the thoughts to come in the front door and you see it leave the back door. When you're thinking of your office work, the door and the front allow the thoughts to come in and then you have tea, you have dinner, you have a long, long conversation with the thought before it finally leaves. That's the difference. One is the awareness of the arising of a thought and then it going away. The other is completely unaware but immersing into that thought, yam cha with the thought, sick fan with the thought, and you are in fact now the thought. You are not aware of the thought, but you have become the thought. So you can walk with total serenity, watch the thoughts and let it go. You need not be the thoughts. You can just be the observer of the thought. And so as Brother Whaley parks his car and walks to his office, as he walks, he can be aware of the steps. And then when a thought arises, he be aware of the arising of the thought. And then he will definitely be arise, aware of the cessation of the thought. Now, our thoughts arise because of causes and conditions. They are not us. Why are people sad or angry or whatever? Because they haven't realized yet that their thoughts and even their emotions are not who they are. Another one is mindful eating, paying attention to what we eat. Now, very often, we do not pay attention after the first bite. We say, oh, sick, ah, and then after that, we continue doing whatever we are doing, watching TV, for example. Now, every now and then, of course, you can try, I can try to create an opportunity where we are eating a meal in a quiet, contemplative state. Of course, when you're socializing with friends, then by all means, don't be antisocial. But do create opportunities every now and then when you're eating a meal by yourself to be mindful. Notice the taste of the food, the texture, and how it makes you feel as you eat it. Salty, sweet, bitter, swallowing, chewing, be aware. So quiet, mindful eating, of course, is practice in the monasteries versus mindless cobbling. And of course, if you look up the internet, you will see many, many techniques on mindful eating, teaching you to be present in the moment, not to look at the TV, not to be judgmental, but to eat the food savoring it moment by moment by moment. And in talking, mindful talking. Now, when you are talking mindfully, you are aware of every word, even before it comes out of our mouth. Let me put it to you this way. If Brother Chu Bun now has five minutes with the Prime Minister of this country to say something, you can be sure Chu Bun will be very mindful of what he is going to say. He is not going to say anything anyhow. He is going to be very mindful of what he's going to say, why he's going to say it, what is he going to say. Now, often, of course, when mindless, he lets some really painful or thoughtless words slip. And of course, all of us undergo this trap. And this is my favorite, my honest all-time favorite, sleep meditation. Now, you will see in the four postures, one of the postures is lying down. 
you can lie down and meditate. A lot of time we will fall asleep. So why don't you use the time when you are trying to sleep to meditate? A wonderful way is to spend that five to 10 minutes as you lie on the bed before you fall asleep in meditation. No pillow talk, just follow the breath going in and out. And of course, thoughts will arise. Things that happen in the day will arise. Things that you fear about tomorrow will arise. Just look at these thoughts. They will arise, and as you are aware of them, they will fade away. This, I find, is a very useful technique. And every one of us sleep every night. So every night, you will have at least this respite for training your mind before you fall asleep. Ajahn Chakat, one of the teachers who taught me, asked us, was it an in-breath or an out-breath before you fell asleep? I have to admit, I could never tell this. But what we can do is to make an effort to turn our attention inwards. And when you do this, when I do this, we are reconditioning ourselves because all the while we are looking outwards. And this looking inwards can become habitual. It is a manner in which we condition our mind to function. So meditation trains our mind. It's in fact bhavana, one aspect of bhavana. And one important thing you will have learned is that you will see in all the techniques that I have shared, is that it allows thoughts and emotions to pass our consciousness without lingering to affect us. Please do not go away thinking that it is to empty our minds. No, that is not what we want. It is to train our mind to change the way we see the internal and external world. It is not what we do, but what we don't do that matters because most of the time we attach, we cling and we yamta with the emotions and the thought which arises because of causes and conditions. So do not resist the emotions or the thoughts, but merely see it, come in and let it go without being entrapped by it. What Ajahn Brahm says, present moment awareness, inspect, not expect, and then letting it go. Let it go. All right. Here you see a very young me with hair, which is still black. Those were the days. So don't meditate to get rid of anything. What you want to get rid is your greed. Do not meditate thinking, I want to achieve this, this, this. That's greed. So don't meditate to get anything like that. Meditate to let go. I, I would say that even if you are to use the English word, I want to get rid, that is in a way anger, that is in a way something that will give rise to emotions again, because I want to get rid of it. It's really more to let go. It will come, I no longer hold on to it, I let it go. Now, what is the balance between worldly and spiritual pursuits? In reality, there should be no boundaries between the spiritual life and the mundane life. Our daily mundane life is also our spiritual life. Now, the foundation of our spiritual practice is to let the Dhamma be the GPS of our lives. And this can only be done with right effort mindfulness and stillness. Dhamma must be applied. If it is not applied, it is just an academic exercise. 
one with this skill in introspection. Whenever greed arises, you can see it and you do not allow it to come to fruition. And greed can arise at any moment as illustrated in this cartoon. Most of the time people look outwards. The man is looking at the beautiful girl. The younger man is looking and say, wow, what a rich man, what a nice Rolex, etc." We are all looking out. This method of bhavana teaches us to look within. And once we do so, you will see greed arising. Note it and like what you have been doing, whether walking, lying down before you sleep or whatever techniques you are used to. You see it come, you do not allow it to latch onto you and the instant you are aware, it slowly fades away. Two, you will learn to be content and be grateful. Be kind, be gentle, have peace in every moment. Three, we talk of keeping our precepts. We chanted just now of keeping our precepts. To keep our precepts requires that we be mindful, introspective, and be able to see greed, hatred arising. It is only then that we can maintain our pledge to keep the precepts. Mindfully maintaining our livelihood. For those who are in business, for those who deal with lots of money, when you are always constantly introspective and mindful and calm, you will tend not to make errors in judgment. By all means, earn your wealth, but earn it righteously. Earn it without breaking the precepts. And wealth is important. No one owns us a living, but it should not be the one and overriding aim of our lives. Five. So I hope by now my examples and illustrations have shown you that meditation doesn't require burning incense or sitting cross-legged. You can sit quite comfortably, stand, walk, or even lie down. And through your own practice, you will find the one that is most suitable for yourself. And now you got to do is to make a commitment every day to set aside time to reflect, relax, and practice. Please do not ask me about meditation. You can sit anywhere, waiting for the MRT, waiting for your boss, and look in your breath at your mind. Similarly, you can stand, walk, and do the same thing. Everything you do can be bhavana, as long as you follow the way of the noble path. So don't believe everything you think, because our thoughts arise because of causes and conditions. And remember, we do not meditate to control these thoughts because these thoughts will arise because of causes and conditions. We meditate, we train, we do practice so that our thoughts do not control us. When greed arises, it is not translated into action. Thank you, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I sincerely hope that with this, you understand what is meant by bhavana, what is meant by meditation better, and you understand and can apply the little life skills and techniques that I had learned in many ways, the hard way that I hope to share with you that you may use in your everyday life. Thank you. Back to you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for clarifying what is meditation and what is not. As a start to the question, Dr. Wong, 
is a uh, formal sitting meditation real ne really necessary of course it is necessary because we need to have some form of training to apply those techniques that i have shared just now if someone is already introduced to the very fundamentals of meditation then it is easy if you have never had even a basic introduction as to what is watching the breath what is watching thoughts then what i shared just now you may not find familiar but an introduction no matter how brief to what is formal meditation and with your understanding of its basic principles you can apply it into the things that i had shared just now all right now unfortunately not everyone has the great blessing of good meditation teachers and sometimes uh, it can be a bit harsh for many people all right to suddenly be asked to go and attend a retreat because they may not be used to the rigors of a retreat so we need to start gently somewhere and i think bgf through what dato victor is doing is doing a very good introduction to what is meditation without the rigors of the retreat thank you dr wong for those listening in through facebook kindly post your questions on facebook comments so that we can get it to dr wong to answer Dr. Wong, would you recommend what uh, any regular type of uh, daily daily sort of uh, schedule for a busy person? All right. Okay, I'll tell you a deep secret which I don't share with people. One, huh? So you've got 343 people here that I'm sharing a secret. Of course, it's only me and my wife in the house. Children are all far away. And Still, we need to find some private time every day that we can sit peacefully. I have a altar right behind me. Some of you have seen it. And there's a sofa right in front of the altar. That is where we designate as our area dedicated to puja, etc. So every time my wife goes to shower, wash her hair, blow her hair, etc., etc., well, as anybody here with low power no it takes a while and then the house is quiet empty and i'm by myself so for me it is every time she goes to take a shower do her hand do whatever she needs to do and that is my gong to do my meditation practice that is why i will just sit on the sofa very comfortably right in front of my buddha image and i do that and of course she showers every day she washes her hair every day and so that is my gong, the equivalent of the temple gong. And then everybody sit down and meditation. So of course, when you do that, it becomes a routine after a while. Okay. So I think that that is something any one of us can also utilize to help make it a routine practice. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good tip. Still waiting for questions to come in from Facebook. Well, we are waiting, Dr. Wong, any other things you'd like to add on this topic? And I can give you a nice sharing. Many years ago, my friends and I were in Myanmar and we were at the this particular Sayadaw's center that uses reading, harsh, rapid reading is the means of focusing the mind. The Sayadaw is called Sun Lun Sayadaw, and not very popular outside Myanmar, but within Myanmar, very popular. And they start by hyperventilating very rapidly and deeply 
Mm. So you can imagine in a huge meditation hall, maybe with hundred yogis, and everybody is doing <sighs> doing that, you know, for five ten minutes, and then suddenly the sayadaw waves his fan up and says, "Stop!" Everybody stop, and you look. When you do that, of course, when you hyperventilate like that for five, ten, fifteen minutes, you have extreme sensations over your body because of the hypocalcemia. You blow out a lot of carbon dioxide, and you go into what we call hypocalcemic state, which will give rise to a lot of pins and needles throughout your whole body. So, the instant he says stop, everybody is to look at all these sensations and follow them intensely. It's not an easy meditation technique. Then we went on to visit Kunlun Sayadaw's hometown, where his actual body is still there in a glass casket. It did not decompose. Amazingly, and they still offer ropes, changing the ropes for him every now and then. So while we were there, that Sayadaw there, chit-chatting with us, asked us, just like I will ask Brother Bobby now. He said, "You know, Brother Bobby, which is the best meditation technique?" Now we are a group of Malaysians and Singaporeans, and each of us, of us have trained in different methods. Now, how to answer that question without musawada? How to answer that question in all honesty and be true to ourselves? And then the venerable laughed heartily, turned and said, "Only you know which is the best meditation technique for you. Every one of us," he said, "is different." The meditation technique that we teach you at Sunun Sayadaw's monasteries not be suitable for you. Only you know which is the technique which you find the most suitable. Hence, he said, "Yes, by all means, explore a few techniques, then find one which you are most comfortable with, and then stick with it." So that was a very, very wise teaching that we got because. Initially, of course, we expected, we thought that he would expect us to say, "Oh, soon in Sayyid Dost," but no, he was much wiser than that, and he actually taught us a very important lesson. Every one of us is different. I cannot force Bobby to do technique A and say that is the best, because ultimately, all of them have the same goal of insight and calmness, calm, relax, and look inwards. Train or the car or the bus. Which leads to it, which might differ from center to center. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Wong. Question from uh, HK Loy from BGF. There are cases where meditation has cured people with terminal illness. Is it because of meditation per se, or perhaps a combination of other factors? Brother Loy, I do not believe in miracles. I do not believe in miracles simply because miracles are merely things that happen that we do not understand, and then we call it miracles. All right? If we understand, it will not be a miracle. So, whether meditation has cured the person, the honest answer is I do not know. It may have contributed to a whole long list of other things. But my standard advice, if ever I'm asked, is please take the best that modern medicine has to offer. Take the best that your family and your government can give you that this modern medicine has to offer. And at the same time, train the mind in metta karuna, as I shared some time ago about what to do when you are sick. Deal with the body with metta. Look at your own body with kindness, and look at your own body with as much love as you would to any other body. That is important. That state of mind will help you with your illness. But do not be shot by two arrows. The Buddha has always said the first arrow of physical illness is inevitable. The second arrow is what is shot into our mind. It's optional. And this is where meditation or training in meditation, even way before you fall sick, will help you avoid that second error. So, I would never, categorically never, tell someone, "Oh, just 
take this or just practice this meditation and not follow what your doctors tell you. No, I would never do that because that would be very foolish, very unwise. Remember always accept, take what modern medicine has to offer, the best that it can offer, please take that. But at the same time, have meditation to calm the mind, have meta meditation for the body because it is not fighting an illness. You are now have a body which has served you many, well, many years, be grateful, treat it with love. Now, as I said, that may well help you, all right? So it may contribute to the curative process, but certainly please do not forsake other things and just do meditation. I think that will be very unwise because you are born into the time where modern medicine is available. Even the Buddha had Dr. Jivaka to treat him for his various illnesses. You are even more blessed. You have even more modern things at the disposal. All right. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Pyong. Dr. Wong. Question from GK Tan from SJBA. Dr. Punia, how should we encourage children to do meditation? All right. We have a brother, Brother Yu Tong, who teaches this to actually do. He actually made it very fun by not teaching in the way in which we treat doubts. You can well imagine that if you're going to catch a group of children and then say, hello into your breath, breathe in and breathe out, it will be very boring. And soon the child will be very distracted. So you have to use ingenuity to develop mindfulness in children. That, was, that is what he did. And he did it very well, from what I can see. Teaching mindfulness to children throw away the word meditation first you use the word meditation you frighten many parents because they think you're going to go around doing um. now three quarter of the time when i tell my friends i'm going for meditation their instant reaction is um. and i tell them what i do has nothing to do with this In all honesty i don't even know what um is you know but for the children that we are trying to teach we're actually teaching them mindfulness we're trying to teach them metta. We are trying to teach them the Brahma Viharas. And that you can do in a child with many ways beyond formal meditation. Um, I think it is beyond my sharing here to go into all those techniques. But there are many techniques. If you are keen, you can even find them on the internet on how to teach mindfulness. Even on YouTube, there are a lot of videos on how to teach mindfulness to children without the word meditation. All right? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from Alexandra Chin from BGF. How powerful is the mindfulness in daily life? Could we do two things at one time to save life, our time? For example, eating and listening to music. We are, in fact, Sister Alexandra doing many things at one time. Many things at one time. All right. And if you have an employer with an employee who can do five things at one time, then the employer will probably tell the employee, why wow, you're very king, uh, very good. Uh, these are very good when we are rushing through things, when we are thinking on the spot. But there are also times when you want to be mindful because mindfulness is a skill. Mindfulness is like a muscle. If you don't develop it, it's going to atrophy. It's going to waste away. So mindfulness is a life skill that helps us make correct decisions. Now, how powerful is it in our daily life? It is very, very powerful. Now, let me tell you, just using Brother Whaley as an example. Whaley drives to work. You know, the jams of Kuala Lumpur are horrible. Somebody cuts him out at the T-junction, horns at him, and Whaley is angry. If he is not a well-trained Dhamma brother without mindfulness, he may well stick out his middle finger, or even worse, like what I just saw on 
video a few days ago, take out the steering lock and go out and bash somebody out. That one act can alter Whaley's life forever. Even the act of sticking a middle finger out, the other guy there, for all I know, could be a very nasty man who come out and bash Whaley up. Or he really picks the steering wheel and bash someone up, you probably go to jail. So mindfulness, stopping like a circuit breaker before we do a reactive response, is something very, very powerful. Because a lot of times, as I shared just now, we act on emotions. In fact, most of the time we act on emotions. Sisters here, how many dresses, gowns, shoes, bags do you have in your cabinet? Probably enough for two families, if not three. But why do we do it? Because at the moment when we are exposed to that nice bag, nice shoe, nice dress, our emotional reaction is, wow, it is so nice. I want to buy it. And of course, advertisers capture that little frailty in our thinking process. And we buy it. If we are rational, you will see there's actually no need to. So mindfulness is a skill which gives you that circuit breaker to stop you from doing actions that you may regret later. Let me give you another example. All right. Now, very many a times when we are at work, our boss calls us for whatever reason. All right. I tell my young doctors, yeah, you did something wrong. The ward specialist, the senior, the consultants who must met you, but they tell you where you buy your degree from, how many pieces you did more, etc. etc. Common for those of us who are in this line. Very often a poor boy or girl reacts emotionally. She hands in even a resignation. And I can tell you I had a student who did that. He was so hurt, so angry, so emotional, he actually handed him his resignation. He, he contacted me and said, I want to give up. I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. Of course, we all spoke to him, we counseled him. He has got a very, very understanding hospital director. I don't know whether he's Buddhist or not. But the hospital director told him, don't act out of emotion. I will keep this letter for a week. If after a week you still feel the same, I will accept the letter. But do not act out of emotions. Okay, so he spoke to us, blah, blah, blah. We counsel him, blah, blah, blah. And then he decided, yeah, that is a bad emotional response. All right, as I shared last week, how do you deal with such things? And he withdrew his resignation letter. Hospital director gave it back to him without much ado. He went on, passed all his postgraduate degrees, and today he's actually a specialist in garment service. Now, if he had looked back in those years, he would say, oh my goodness, my whole life would have changed if not for that nice hospital director. So for all of us sitting in this hall now, in this virtual hall, you may not have such a lucky boss who keeps your letter for one week, you know. That one moment of an emotional response could have altered your life forever. So mindfulness is very, very powerful. It gives you that time, that space to evaluate that decision, whether that is the best decision. Remember I told you, the background knowledge, control the emotional mind so that the logical mind functions. The emotional mind is what makes you eat that cake. The emotional mind is what makes a happily married man have an affair. Very often, as most of us in this Dhamma Dutta work, see, oh, that man, yo, why did he do something like that? Such a good family and an affair now, everything is upside down. It's crazy or what? Man or what? It is simply not worth it. But, you know, if you study meditation, you study what we just shared, you will realize that he did it because his emotional mind controlled his rational mind. And at that moment in time, he was thinking with the wrong end of his body. So what the Buddha Dharma teaches us is to accelerate this evolutionary process so that it is your logical mind that is dominant and not your emotional mind which is dominant. So now, 
you will realize why Mr. Spock is a scientific officer of the Starfish Starship Enterprise, because his mind is logical. He does not allow emotions to affect him. He thinks very logically, and sometimes, in a way, it became a disadvantage because in some senses, we need to balance emotion and logic to come to the wise decision. So with that, I hope you understand. Remember, the Buddha Dharma, the training of the mind, is for you and me to calm our emotional minds down and not allow our emotional minds to make irrational decisions, but to let the rational mind, your neocortex, your new brain, make that decision based on the most logical, rational thinking. All right, Brother Bobby? Yeah, thank you, Daro. Dukakos uh, asking, is do, do emotional people have more difficulties in meditation? Well, if someone is very emotional, it, I would think that it would be best to first see what is he emotional to. Some people have anger issues. Yes, that's very, very common. Some people have anxiety issues. That's also very common. And it's only just today that a very dear person to me wrote to me that when she did with me, inside meditation, she developed a lot of conflicts. And yeah, I would think that if someone has emotional issues, anger issues, it is best to start with just mindfulness of the breath. Learn to calm the emotions down first. Okay, let me put it this way. If you are a person with anger issues, every time somebody overtakes you in the car, you know, I'm sure every one of you here have the experience. Someone overtakes you in the car, you you, you snap, step on your brake because the guy stopped cutting in front too fast. You give a horn. Then the guy in front will purposely break, 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 just to irritate you. Suddenly, why not his window and give me the middle finger? And of course, here we just look at it and say, ah, maybe he's in a hurry, you know, maybe he has an emergency. Let's try and look at it from his point of view. But for these people, for you and me, with such issues, I think that that driving meditation would be a very good way for you to calm your mind down so that you do not react in such an unwholesome way and get yourself and your family in trouble. So yes, I must say, people who are very emotional, it is best, at least that's in my opinion, others may differ, to start with something that helps you calm down. And I personally find using the beads, which BGF has adapted to just rubbing the fingers, all right? It's a very effective way of making our mind focus on something very neutral. Moving your fingers, rubbing it, is very neutral. Moving a bead, is very neutral. But it gives you an additional focus to direct your attention. All right, so very often we say, oh, when you're angry, uh, don't do anything, uh, count to 100, look, count your breath 10 times. It is basically the same technique being applied. All right, thank you, Brother Bobby. I promoted BGF method many times today already. Thank you, Tarong, for promotion. <laughs> Question from uh, doc, from uh, Brother Tong Kok Wai from SJBA. When dealing with addiction, smoking, drugs, pornography, gambling, etc., what is your experience with meditation on the recognition of trigger factors or cues which will help break the habit? Well, Brother Kong, Tong Kok Wai, dear, dear friend of mine of many years. Kok Wai, I think that at least in, again, personal experience, this will require a combination of both calming and insight. Because first, of course, we need them to calm themselves down. Um, maybe these people are very, very emotional. Once the cigarette comes or whatever comes, they completely lose control of their mind. So one way is, of course, to calm it down. But they have to have insight that what they are doing is wrong. If there is no insight, it will never change. Just like, um, again, we have this brother who is a who volunteers his services free, a counselor. He volunteers his Buddhist counseling services free in JB. And we often chit chat, have dinner. And he tells me in counseling, if a person does not have insight that what he or she is doing is wrong, and I'm going to have 
very, very little impact in his life. So similarly with smoking, drugs, pornography, gambling, the person must have some insight that what he is doing. And secondly, when he has that insight, then of course we have to get him to calm himself so that he does not react in a very inappropriate manner. Now, having said all this, uh, addiction to nicotine, addiction to alcohol, addiction to whatever forms is actually very, very difficult to break because beyond the thinking process, beyond the emotional process, there is also a physical drive. Nicotine and ethanol, which is what is active in alcohol, are very powerful addictive substance. All right. So I often tell my medical students, I often tease them, please don't marry somebody who is a smoker or who takes alcohol. Then one of them will say, but maybe he will be willing to change my... Then I say, well, he may love you, but he loves nicotine and ethanol more. Why? Because both nicotine and ethanol are physically addictive. You are not. You are replaceable, I tell them. To them, nicotine and ethanol is not replaceable. So beyond the calming and the insight, we also have to deal with a third factor, which is the physical addiction here. All right? In many, many situations, actually, this requires professional help. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from Shalom Buddhist Society, Brother Leong Yu Meng. During certain meditation retreats, the teacher will tell us to leave our meditation techniques and follow the master's technique. Should we follow the master's technique? Uh, Brother Leong Yu Ming, thank you for attending. Brother Leong Yu Ming, I notice is a very staunch supporter of our continuous tourism. All right. The good news to you, Brother Leong, is that even when the 25th session of this Breaking Myth series ends, the committee has decided to continue with the Walking in the Buddha's Footstep, which is my other book. We will still continue with this series because it will be a sad thing to lose the 4,000 people who watch our Daring Every Friday night. So that's the good news, Brother Leong. I noticed and I thank you for all your messages that you sent in the chat session to me. Thank you. Yeah, first and foremost, you are attending a retreat from a master, which means that you wish to learn his technique, isn't it? You know, why are you even attending his, his, his retreat? The mere fact that you are attending his retreat means you wish to learn his technique. And just like the off-use Chan teaching, empty your cup. If you go in there with lots of preconception of how it should be, and you are teaching the teacher, you know, not the teacher teaching you. So if you want to go in there and learn this teacher's methodology, then we have to empty our cup and follow the teacher. And as I shared earlier, there are so many, many different techniques, but they are only different superficially. As you go deeper, you will find that they're actually almost the same. They go to the same targets, the same goals. And finally, you will find one method that is suitable for you. I started personally with the Mahasi method, but after a while, I found the labeling very, very destructive. All right. And at that time, Kundala was still alive, the late Venerable Kundala was still alive. And he was in JB. And I had a private session with him. He actually advised me, if you find it destructive, that means it is time to drop all the labeling. All right? Because he said, all those labelings are skillful means. You, could not, you should not be holding on to them like gold and then insisting that you must label everything all the time. Because you will naturally reach a point where you will actually find it a hindrance. And he actually said, drop all the labeling techniques. Just look at your mind. So I found from that that, aha, ultimately we are still going back to looking introspectively into ourselves. So I hope I've answered your question, Brother Leong. And I say, once again, I thank you for your encouragement and all your words. Every time you attend this box, you always write something pleasant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Question from Elin Tay. 
What is the recommended time duration for meditation? 20 or 30 minutes? Mr. Eileen, there is no recommended time because as I shared the slide just now, formal meditation, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half hour, one hour, and then we change posture into everyday life. But you can continue that meditation into everyday life. And it's the technique of introspection. So, the Buddhist bhavana is 24 hours, you know. All right, mindfulness is a 24 hour thing. Satipatthana or Sampajana is a technique which we utilize. It is not an exercise that we do for 15 minutes and then drop it. But of course, having said that, we all begin with exercises. And when do you stop? I think your body will tell you when do you stop. Your body itself, your mind itself will tell you that this intention to stop is there and you will accept it. Okay? Thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from LYTO. Dr. Wong, how important is it to reach jhana? For the beginning, how long? For the beginner, how long should they practice before achieving the first jhana? Who was asking? Uh, this is uh, LYTO from uh, TBCM Brother Facebook. Kyo. Brother or Sister Kyo, I'm, I'm not sure from what you Okay. Let me answer to you this way. This same, or not same, similar question was asked um, when I was with a very senior venerable teaching meditation. And I thought he gave the best answer. And so I'm going to repeat, or rather paraphrase, that answer. Okay? So, Brother Teo, I hope you will find this answer helpful. This is a, a meditation teacher, a humble meditation teacher. And someone asked him, what about all the jhanas and all the yanas that those of you in the Burmese tradition might be familiar with, huh? or the stages of yanas and all the stages of jhanas. He asked the teacher, Avante, what stage I am? At what stage do you think I have achieved? At what stage have I reached? Which yana, which jhana have I reached based on what I described to you? The Venerable gave this answer. I happened to be there. He said, when I was a young monk, I was in a forest center in Thailand. In that center, it was the rains retreat. So all of us monks, at that time he was younger, now he's old, was under this very famous master who is supposed to be very good with meditation. We all came from various centers to be trained with him during the rains. And so every one of them trained, meditated, did whatever they need to do. And they were all very anxious, just like you are now, as to which yana and which jhana that I have attained, etc., etc. And they all among themselves uniformly agreed that this Bhante among them has deep jhana. He's really very calm, very composed. He's able to still his mind. So during the question and answer session, well, all these were raised, of course. And so the Venerable told his assistant, I want you to take this Venerable, whom all the rest say has such deep jhana, into the forest. I want you to bring him in there. And when he's in the forest, I want you to leave him there. But stay some distance away and just keep an eye on him. But leave him there in the forest. Fine. So that was done. So when the guy was brought into the forest, he was left alone in the forest. After a while, he got lost and then he panicked. Like any one of us reacted in a way that any person who is in a panic will react. And of course, the assistant came out of the blue and brought him back to civilization. So that's one part. The second part, he said, was during the rains, people will come and bring a lot of nice food. And then the Venerable Master will take the nice food and distribute it to the senior people who are assisting him 
And then they all had lousy food. And the one time when he said people brought something like ice cream, something like what Ajahn Brahm said, then the master go and mix it up with the rice and all that, and then let the junior monks take it. And so he said they were all very angry, they were all very upset. How oh, can this fellow be a senior, very famous master? So to cut the long story short, we reached the ends of the retreat, the end of the retreat, the end of the rains. And he said, we all sat together and the master briefed every one of them. He said, among you all, you said, venerable so-and-so, deep jhana, deep samadhi, so calm. That is only because he is in a controlled environment. Something he is familiar with, something that he knows. The instant I ask him to be brought into an unfamiliar environment, there goes all his calmness. The state of calmness is not just calmness given a set of conditions. You are to train that state of calmness that can be applied in everyday life irrespective whether you are a junior monk or a lay person. Second, he said, I know all of you are very angry with me because I gave you lousy food. And I admit that I did it. But with good reason. When you were angry with me because you think I gave you angry food, were you looking at your mind and seeing anger arise? How you felt you said you are all well practicing monks, well trained. All I did was create a cause. You know, our thoughts, our emotions, they arise from causes and conditions. We always talk about that, isn't it? But putting it into reality is two different things, you know. So he said, all I did was create a cause. That cause is by what you think is unfairly giving you not so nice food. And what has happened? In your minds, that cause has created all these thoughts, etc., etc. Were you aware of those thoughts? Were you practicing as a good monk, applying meditation to your life, stopping greed, hatred, and ignorance as it arises? Those of you who did, I congratulate you. Those of you who are angry with me, you need to stay back for more training. So I think that when I overheard the Venerable explaining to this person, I thought that that was a wonderful explanation. From that moment onwards, I don't bother about reading Yana, Yanas anymore, whether I've reached that Nama, Rupa, Yana or what is immaterial to me. Because as I shared in a slide just now, I do not meditate to see myself getting, oh, I'm very good in meditation. I meditate so that that meditation makes me a better person. Creating better, like that venerable was trying to instigate in the students that he was training. So I hope, brother or sister, Tio, that answers your question. If you say, I am going to meditate because I must attain this jhana by that stage, and then like, you know, kamikaze, you tie that thing around your head. That is spiritual greed. Don't have to do it. Zuran, it will arise naturally. Don't worry whether it takes you one day, one year, or 10 years to achieve it. All right? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That's the last question for the night. So, thank you for the wonderful sharing on no time to meditate. And uh, for those listening in, kindly tune in tomorrow at 2 o'clock. We have uh, with us Agachita, Bhante Aga Ayasma Agachita and uh, Ayasma Arya Damika. They'll be sharing on how to protect the Buddha's dispensation. So kindly tune in tomorrow at 2 o'clock across uh, our Facebook pages. So let us now share the merits that we have uh, gathered from this uh, tonight's sharing and uh, we have made the right effort to participate in this Dharma sharing 
We renew our faith and refuge in the three jewels and learn to develop compassion and wisdom. May all beings without limit have a share of this merit and with whatever other merit that we have made. Those who are near, dear and kind to us, including our mother and father, teachers, friends and relatives, our dearly departed relatives and others, whether neutral or hostile, all sentient beings in the universe, if they know of our dedication of merit, may they rejoice with us. By reason of their rejoicing in our gift of merit, may all beings be free from harm and danger and live with peace and happiness. Let us now make an aspiration. May we meet with wise teach friends and teachers who guide us along the path of Buddha Dhamma and finally attain the perfect state of Nibbana where all sufferings cease. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Good night everyone and thank you everyone to listening in and to all the participating organizations. See you tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock.